today. Uh, for you guys. All right, good. Praise the Lord. Um, anyway, we, uh, as we've been studying for today's message, we kind of have some new revelation about this relationship. Right? Because uh, we always read scripture that says, like, you know, we're supposed to be the head of the household, and she's supposed to be submissive to me in all things, and we think, oh, right, that's the way the word of God says. But I think today, we're going to look at this maybe a little bit different. Is that okay? Are you ready for some new uh, kind of gospel revelation of what the word of God says about this relationship? Yeah. Amen? And look at it in a way that, you know, it's, it's, for, it's inclusive for everybody. So, Marissa, you're not left out. You'll see that it's important because when you pick a man, you want a man that's going to follow what we tell you today, okay? And we'll make sure that he's righteous and holy and everything before you get married. Uh, Mino for you too. We'll find a wife for you that is, yes, you know, she's going to be holy and pure and wonderful and she'll, she will, she may not meet all your needs, but she'll be godly person. Is that okay? And, uh, whoa, what does that mean? So anyway, we'll we'll talk about that a little bit. But anyway, we are we are excited about this series. I want to, uh, as we open up today, would you do? Would you please open your Bibles to that famous passage in Ephesians chapter five? And we want to read it for you together. Um, we're gonna probably read the whole chapter if you don't mind. And uh, I'll have my lovely wife do that. She reads so much better than I do. And um, before. Let me just preface this, and I will pray before we start. I want you to open up your hearts to hear what the Word of God is saying this morning, more than what I'm going to say, or what Tina's going to say. Amen? There's some truths in here that we maybe have been uh, missing. I won't say teaching the wrong way, but maybe we've been missing something in the Word of God, and we're hopefully we'll amplify that or reveal that. Hopefully the Holy Spirit will help you understand what the Word of God says about a husband and wife relationship. Amen? Because I can, I read marriage books, and I've been through counseling, and I've been through seminars, and I did a lot of things, and sometimes I hear the same thing over and over and over again. And when I read the Word of God, maybe uh, it doesn't quite sit right in my spirit. Is that okay? <coughs> And I think God's going to show us something, I think, will help us, not only in a husband and wife, wife relationship, but in every relationship that we have. With our workers, our co-workers, our moms and dads, our brothers and sisters, each of us together. So, uh, I, I was, when we were, getting, we were going through this all day yesterday, we went through this whole thing all day yesterday, over and over and over. Week, yeah. The whole week, yeah, we were just going through this, but yesterday we kind of formalized it all. But it was like over and over in our spirit, it's like, man, this, there's something deeper truths to what we think, uh, our Western thinking, our, um, our American, if you will, or even some cultural thinkings about marriage. This is so much better than what we, man, I just like want to apologize to my wife for not being the person I'm supposed to be in front of you all because it's like this truth was revealed. It's amazing. So let's do this. Let's just bow our heads for a moment. Ask God's Holy Spirit to help us understand today what he wants us to learn and understand. Father, we thank you so much. God, for this day, as we uh, celebrate um, Valentine's Day, Lord, our love and uh, the people that we admire, Father God, we know that you admire us even more, and you love us even more, and you sacrifice even more, and you revealed so much to us these last weeks, Lord God. I pray, God, today as we minister and we share from our hearts, God, that everyone here today would receive revelation of how we're supposed to be for your glory, Father God. Use us this morning, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. Therefore, be imitators of God, as verse 1. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you, and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. But immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. And there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is, an, who is an idolater has an inheritance 
inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Verse 6. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them, for you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light, for the fruit of the light consists of all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Verse 11. Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of these things which are done by them in secret. But all things become visible when they are exposed to the light. For everything that becomes visible is light. For 14. For this reason it says, Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. So then, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dis 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 dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of, the, of Christ. Verse 22. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as, as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is also the head of the church, but he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she would be holy and blameless. 28. So husbands ought to also love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Verse 32. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. Praise the Lord. Let the Lord add his blessings to his word this morning. I, I thought it was uh, important to, uh, to read that so we can understand that the, the scripture, and is, is, as Paul was writing this book, he was writing it uh, kind of a last, uh, one of his last epistles, and this was what some of the most important things that he was writing, and I thought it was important we read the whole thing because we're going to go through it just a little bit. But let's talk about marriage for a second. I just want to give you some facts about uh, today's marriage. How many know that over 50% of the marriages today end in divorce? That's the kind of statistics. It goes from uh, of non believers and believers. So there's something that's uh, out, of, uh, out of order there. Um, just a few years ago, in 1960, how many can remember that? How many ago that was? Um, the, uh, some of us can remember that. Um, in 1960, the divorce rate was like 20, less than 25 percent. Mm -hmm. So there's something, something changed in our culture. In 1960, cohabiting, living together, was almost non-existent. Just in 1960, a few years ago, and now we see that over uh, 40 percent of women between the ages of 20 and 40 live together with somebody. Um, uh, obviously, that's uh, not the way God designed it. Um, the divorce rate uh, among people that actually live together, the thought is if I live together and I get to find out if I really love this person, 
right? Um, and we can uh, spend time together, uh, then, you know, maybe uh, we would live happily ever after. Because okay. I'm looking for my soul. Because I'm looking for, how many have ever heard this? Uh, ear harmony, right? I'm looking for my soulmate, the perfect one, right? I'm looking for the one that's going to sweep me off my feet and make me feel so wonderful. It's going to let me do, and I think part of that is, is going to let me be what I want to be, and, and I want you to support what I want to do, <coughs> and you can do what you want to do, but we will be together. You ever hear that? That's kind of common today. Um, I think the um, the also statistically, the earlier that sex is introduced into a marriage, the the uh, into a relationship, into a relationship yeah. the, uh, the the divorce rate or the separation rate is even higher. So we say we're gonna we're gonna get together, we're gonna do this, and we're gonna you know we're gonna come together and we're gonna live together so we can figure out if we should get married. Make sure we're compatible. Statistically, if that doesn't work, right? Not at all. Um, it, but out of the people that are married, you know, we say everybody that's married is unhappy. You ever hear that? Everybody's unhappy. No, there's no happy marriages. That's not true. Over 60% of the people that are married are happy. And we know the people that are married and stay married are happier, they're healthier, they're, they have more wealth, they, they, they're, uh, they're, uh, their families are, are more secure. And so we know those, those statistics are true. Um, we uh, also, uh, we, want to uh, explain today the purpose between the biblical uh, uh, view of marriage as far as a covenant marriage and a contractual marriage. So I have a contract, I go to the courthouse, I get my piece of paper, and it says we can get married and we do whatever we want. Huh? Right? You get a piece of paper, it's done, I get this piece of paper, it tells me that we can get legally get married, we get married, and we just do what we want to do, we can do what you want to do. We're happy for a time. How many of you ever heard that it's a five, the five-year thing? People are married for about five years, and all of a sudden we start looking for love in all the other places. And that's because we don't have a covenant marriage. See, years ago, even today, I think today more, it's about what I can get out of this marriage <laughs> and what you can get out of this marriage instead of what the institution of marriage itself. Right. Well, if you look at the eHarmony idea, the idea of my soulmate, it's, a, it's more about what can you do for me? You're going to love me and not change me. You're going to support me in everything that I do, and you're not going to shackle me. It's about me. That's, the, that's really kind of the worldview, but the biblical view is not that way. It's more of a covenant relationship. It's a covenant marriage instead of a me marriage. Genesis, uh, in Genesis 2.24, it says, A man shall leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one fat flesh. They make a commitment for the institution of marriage over themselves. Right, for the common good of each other. I give myself away to you. And I give myself to you. For his good, for the good of the family, even. It used to be now that a lot of people talk about, if you look back when um, maybe early 70s, the, the marriage relationship sometimes, or even the 60s, the husband and wife would stay together for why? For the children. For the good of the children. For the good, the common good of the society because. If there's a husband and wife that are married, mother, father, the children have a place where really two or three hundred percent, that when they get older, their lives are going to be better. That's the biblical view. The purpose of marriage being for the common good of the family, the common good of even, might I say, society. Because if there's a mother and father in a house, the children are secure. They are more likely to succeed because they have a mom and a dad in the household. So, we... We're going to take that. We're now going to take that thought mm -hmm. that we're doing it for good. We're doing it good for our family. We're doing it good for society. We're going to do it good for uh, the health of our children. And it is statistically 
basically 200 or 300% uh, success rate of people that stay married and their kids will raise up and have healthy families. And uh, healthy so lives and, healthy and lives prosperous. And prosperous. So things. now, let's, let's take this just, uh, uh, let's just look at this a little bit, uh, how God views it. In view of the gospel. In view right. of the gospel. So in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 through 27, we see that um, the marriage is the husband and the wife, or the man and the woman, were created in the image of God. True. He created male and female. He created them both in his image. Right. So with that in mind, we know... We were already image bearers of God until the fall. Knowing that we are the image bearers of God, we bear his image, we can then even go further and say that we are the hands and feet of Jesus to the world. We are the hands and feet of Jesus to the world. I've heard it said even that sometimes you are the Bible that some people will ever read. You are the Word of God that some people will ever read. They may not open a Bible because of what it stands for to them. When they see you, you are bearing the image of God. So if we are the hands and feet to the world, we can look at some scriptures that really kind of bear that out. If you were to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 27, let's go there and see where we're referred to. Paul tells us specifically that we are the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 27. For even as the body is one, and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, through though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we were all made to drink of one spirit. Verse 14. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot says, because I'm not the hand, I'm not part of the body, it is not for this reason any less part of the body. I mean, if your foot were to decide I'm not part of my body, it still would, it would cease to be my foot, right? And if the ear says, because I am not an eye, I am not part of the body, it is not for this reason, you know, that it would be any less of my body. It would still be part of me. Verse 17, if the whole body were an eye, where would the, the hearing be? And if the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? Verse 18, but now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body just as he desired. If they were all one member, where would the body be? But now there are many members but one body, and the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, it is much truer that the members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary, and those members of the body which we deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor, and our less presentable members become much more presentable, whereas our more presentable members have no need of it, but God. I love it when it says, but God. But God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to that member which lacked, verse 25, so that there may be no division in the body, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, then all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it, verse 27. Now you are Christ's body, and individually members of it. We're all one body. We're all part of one body. And in Ephesians 4.25, it says the same thing. We're all one body. All one body. And Jesus himself, when he was on the road to Damascus, 
Okay, in Luke, Paul, yes, I'm sorry. Yes, that's my lateral. So um, Luke 24, 13 through 35, Paul is on his way to do what? He's on his way to persecute the Christians. He's been doing that for some time. And what happens? Jesus shows up. And what does he say to him? Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Now was Saul really persecuting him, Jesus himself, in his, in his, his body? No. He was persecuting the church. Jesus himself looks at us as one body. So we are the hands and feet, I say again, of Jesus to the world. So when they look at us, we are to be a visible representation of Jesus. Wow. So whether you're married or not, it doesn't matter. We are all to be the visible representation of Jesus to the world. Now let's carry it one more step further. Let's look at it as a Christian marriage. Christian relationship, right? The Christian relationship, the Christian marriage is meant to be a visible window into the character and life of Christ, his work, and his salvation. And if you think about it, if it's done right, if this relationship is done right, then what an awesome thing for the world to see. They are seeing the very image of God's character. We, as a husband and wife, are the representation of Jesus, his work, and his salvation. So Father created everything. Now, if you think about this, if you go to um, seminary or Bible college, and Andy and Rachel would be able to, to point this out, if you sit in a class 101, Bridal College, no, Central Bible College, <laughs> Um, if you go, they're going to teach you in this class, you think that you're going to um, learn how to be a better Christian, right? But really what happens in theology class is they lay out all of these arguments about, well, you know, when we humans look at God, we try to ascribe things that we see. That could really mess with somebody who's going into to theological studies. What do you mean? It almost is explaining God away, but you have to, if you read anything about, if you read any of C.S. Lewis's works, one of the arguments he says is that if indeed God were in the beginning, before any of this, he created show and tell. He created everything <coughs> in the earth to show and tell us about who he is, what he's done for us. So think about that. When our little kids go off to elementary school and they have show and tell, God was doing show and tell before he created it. He's showing and telling how everything is to be. So when we look at our fathers, he is father with a big F. Because that's who he is. He's supposed, we, our fathers are supposed to be like that. When we look at a Christian marriage, we are supposed to be showing God's character, his mercy, and his, and his grace. Amen. So, man, it's your turn to uh, talk to you just for a few minutes about our role in this wonderful marriage and maybe it's not going to be let's just open our hearts to receive is that okay let's see what the word of god says about the man in christian marriage we both get to play the role of jesus tina gets to play jesus and i get to play jesus and when we're together 
people should see Jesus. Amen? Our love for one another, the way we serve one another, how we take care of one another, we represent Jesus. Everybody say amen. amen. So let's look at, look at the role that Jesus played in this. If you have your Bibles, would you just turn, or your phones, whatever, to Philippians chapter 2. Jesus was submissive to the Father's will. Ephesians, uh, Philippians chapter 2, and verse 1 through 11, I want to just read that to you. Why are we reading so many, I told Tina, we're reading too many scriptures. We should just preach from the heart. People will just hear our heart and they'll want to be like Jesus. Then I thought, well, let's, before we get to that point in the message, let's just set up the scriptures and see what it says so we can go back and look at them. In Philippians chapter 2, it says this in verse 1. If you have any encouragement being from united. Uh, from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded. So that's just talking as a general, as a body, right? Uh, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, men and women, uh, but in humility consider others better than yourself. <laughs> Wouldn't that be amazing if we walked that way? We'd consider everybody's needs before ourselves, lifting them up, encouraging them, the, the people that we work with, our family, our children. It would just be amazing if we just would follow these simple instructions here. Each of you should look not only in your own interest, but also the interests of others. And this is the attitude you should have. Your attitude should be that of Christ Jesus. He's the example. He's the one we should follow. Amen? I say, don't follow Bob and Tina. Follow Jesus. Follow Jesus. Fall in love with Jesus. Know Him. Desire Him. Taste Him. See that He's good. Want to be like Him. And then everything seems to work out after that. Amen? Everything seems to be working. Now look what Jesus' attitude was. Who, being the very nature of God, did not consider Himself equal, something to be grasped. He, even though he was equal with God, he lowered himself. Look what he says. But made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself and, being, and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore God exalted him to the high place and gave him the name that is above every name, that in the name of Jesus Christ, Every knee shall bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And, and he did all this. Look at the last part of this. He did this all to the glory of the Father. Hallelujah. Lord, I want my life to be to represent you so much that it brings glory to Father God. Amen? I want to be so Jesus here is giving us guys an example of how we should be. He took on the very act of servanthood. He was obedient to the Father God even unto death. This is the essence of how we should serve one another. We should be just like Jesus, willing to do the will of the Father, willing to love when people are unlovable, willing to serve even though we don't feel like it. Why? Because our whole life should represent God. Our whole attitude, our whole success, our whole wealth, and our education, and all that we do should represent Jesus. Amen? Ephesians, um, so Jesus was not only a servant here, but look at uh, Ephesians 5. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 5. So Jesus was a servant, but he also was head, right? He was head of the church. So let's look at Ephesians chapter 5 again, if you could just go there. In verse 25 through 27. This is the this is part of the scripture that we all kind of mess up. We kind of use this against our wives, you know. This is a, this is this is Christian teaching gone wrong. All right. This is something that we we've, we've taken it to a level that it shouldn't be. And we're going to talk about how men and women are equal in just a minute. But let's look at Jesus here. It says, "Husbands, love your wives just as uh, just as Christ loved the church and gave Himself up for her." To make her, now listen, Jesus did this. She's talking about his body, the, the, the church. To make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. Cleansing your church. You want to get cleansed? You, you think your life is not like being the way you should be for Jesus? Then you need to be in the word so it can cleanse you. It can wash you. Jesus provided this word for you so we can be like him. Amen? 
and then to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or even or even a blemish, but holy and blameless in the same way husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. So Jesus not only was the head of the church, and he, he was the head of church, but he was willing to die for the church. Right? Now he submitted his will to God, so he's servant, and he's also the head. But being the head is totally different than what we think in the natural. Being the head means that he died for her. I'm willing to lay my life down for him. I want to serve him. I want to submit my will. The song we sang was really good. Because, like, give myself away, give all what I am, every, all my identity, I want to give it all away so I can be like Jesus. We don't teach that in the church today. Today in the church, we just want to give you, like, oh, this poor Christian, help let me help you. No, you have to serve and you have to give your life up for God. Then when you do that, then this relationship is so different. Right? When I say I surrender all, God, and your will be done, not my will. Everything is yours. And then I don't have a problem with my relationship with my wife. I want to serve her. I want to love her. I want to take care of her. And she does the same thing for me. She wants to serve God with her heart, soul, mind, body, and strength. Because my needs can't be met by her. Get ahead. <laughs> Psalm, uh, Psalms 23 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. <coughs> Anybody read that? You know what I'm talking about? So what does that really mean? If the Lord is my shepherd, I don't want anything. He's going to provide all that I need. I can ask him for wealth. I need money to pay the bills. I need education to do a better job. I need all these things. But that, that again, is the purpose of my life is not to do all those things. The purpose of my life on earth is to represent Jesus and bring glory to the Father. So my desire is changed. When I look at the Word of God now, I don't look at this passage as, oh, I'm going to lord over my wife. That was a curse in the garden. Right? And the husband will lord over the wife. Look at Genesis chapter 3. But now, because of Jesus in my life, I'm lord over I serve her. And I'll die for her. The gospel changes everything. <coughs> my relationship with her is different now. I love her. I don't expect anything from her. I want to give whatever she needs. And in that, she, she serves me and loves me too. And if it's, what I, it's a miraculous thing that happens, I, it's not like I, I, I need something from her. She provides that for me already. In everything. It's not a have to. It's a want to. I want to serve this church with all my heart, soul, mind, mind, and strength. I want you to know Jesus. I want you to know Jesus provided an example for me. That he was not only a ser servant, sub subject himself to God's will, but also he was able to die. He wanted to die for you and me. That's the attitude we should have in everything. Amen? Um, so this is the other thing. Uh, Galatians, let's go to uh, Galatians chapter 3. Would you turn there with me? This is a, an important uh, a truth also that we need to realize. I wanted to listen to the sermon over myself to see what I just said. <laughs> Galatians chapter 3 says this. This is amazing. God is not only looking at as, as us as sons. He also looks at us as his bride. He also looks at us as his children. He looks at us as he calls us his bride. I mean, think about that. We're his bride. Men, you're the bride of Christ. Can you get, grasp that? He calls us sons. All of us. The male, women and men. Look at verse 26. You are all sons of God. What does all mean? All, look it up in the Greek, it means all, or Hebrew, it's the same word. All, it means all of us, that means male and female, we're all his sons. Right? Through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew, nor Greek, slave, nor free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Say, I'm all one in Christ Jesus. All We're all one. one. We're all Jesus. one. He doesn't look at us different. He's not going to give, because Marissa's a girl, he's not going to give her some different blessings. Or, or Andy's a man, so he's going to give her. No, it's the same blessings, the same forgiveness, the same hope, it's the same everything, because male and female. He doesn't look at us differently. That's significant, because if you think about the history of the culture, sons, 
were very important. Sure. They were very important. They so inherited their wealth. Everything. Women didn't really matter. Is that true? In society Across the world, at that time. in society, women are treated like they're they're doing they're not equal. But in God's eyes, you're equal. In some cultures, you can't even walk, go in public without a man being with you. But in God's eyes, you're you're equal. You have the same inheritance. You have the same blessings. You are like instead of being the uh, uh, cast aside, you're actually brought up to sonship or the responsibility and the blessings of being like the first son. It's amazing. God loves you. Servant leadership is so important. Look at. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter five. I just want to read this because I know I just want you to know I'm not making this stuff up. This is from the Word of God. We are men. We're supposed to be servant leaders. <laughs> And all of us should be servant leaders, for a matter of fact. But look at verse 1 in chapter 5, verse 1. Are you there? This is important. Look at this. Be imitators of God. Who is supposed to be imitators of God? All of us. The whole body of Christ. You might drive down the butt line and somebody cuts you off. I'm not really imitating God at that moment. Right? We, get, we know sometimes we're not imitating. Maybe we get starts talking about people. Or we say things that are not uh, lovely towards people, right? We have bad attitude, which we don't have. But it's just maybe some people have that. You know, uh, we should imitate God. What would God do? God loves you. God loves you. And he cares about everything in your life. And he says, be an imitator. Uh, uh, Paul's writing here, be an imitator of God. Look what else says. Therefore, as dearly loved children, now he's calling us to his sons, now he's calling us children, and live as life of live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, as a fragrant offering to the Lord. He was willing to die for the message, if you will, to get uh, uh, proclaimed throughout the world. I'm dying, so uh, the, the forgiveness, the deliverance. Everything that you need is through my death and my resurrection. I'm unwilling to serve out of love. Verse 3, but among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality. This is a problem in the, in the church and in, in society. We have all these sexual opportunities and sin, and we just, you know, we're Christians. We think we're strong enough. We're not. You can't partake of stuff that's not holy and think you can overcome that. We can't do it. That's why we have a sin nature. We need God's help in all those things. This is real. I said sex in church, though. Is that okay? Um, <laughs> or of any kind of impure or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Who's God's holy? Now we're called God's holy. You're God's holy people. If you said, yes, I am a follower of Jesus, I ask God to forgive me of my sins, and His blood cleansed me, and I'm now I'm serving Jesus. And maybe I don't feel like I'm really running this race like I should be, but man, I am, you are holy in God's eyes. You're going to be the one at the end that will bow your knees and confess that Jesus is Lord. There's going to be people that don't do that, but the whole world's going to do that. It's kind of nice to do it on this side of eternity instead of on the other side where you have to. I bow my heart. I bow my life. I bow my will. I bow everything to Him. Amen. I want Jesus to be glorified in my life. Verse 5, For of uh, this you can be sure, no immorality, impure, or greedy person, such as a man, as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of God, uh, of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words of, uh, for, I'm sorry, uh, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. So if you don't, if you dabble in all these things, you're being disobedient, and there's some punishment that's going to happen. Is that <coughs> that's what the Word of God says. We have to be pure. We have to be imitators of God. And if you're not that way, then why, why am I always struggling? Because maybe we have some disobedience in our life. Is that okay? Maybe we're not following Jesus like we're supposed to. Maybe we're not imitating Christ the way we're supposed to. Amen? God is, and he's not going to, uh, he's going to help me. We'll get to that at the end. Therefore, do not be uh, partners with anybody that's like that. 
So I can serve the world. I can serve the unbeliever. I can love them. I can, I can even go to their parties. But I don't have to participate in all the things that they're doing. Amen? To be a witness for, for the kingdom of God. Verse 8. For you were once in darkness, but now you are light in the, in the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. There's no, you should know the truth. Because God's going to reveal truth to you in everything. Look at politics today. What's the truth? Look at life today. What's the truth? What's the truth at work? What's the truth at your home? Everything. God's going to lead you to all truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. What's pleasing to you right now, God? Maybe you should ask that question instead of what pleases me. Because when you ask that question, God's going to give you what you need and what you want and what you desire. It's just amazing how it happens. Amen? It's just amazing how when we serve Him, He gives us what we need. Have nothing to do with them, uh, with, the, with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them, for it is shameful even to mention what is disobedient in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, for it is light that makes everything visible. This is when he says, wake up, we'll sleep, and um, arise. arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. And that's what I want today. Man, that's Christ shining on you. Jesus changed the idea of leadership by serving. Also, he, he changed the gifts of authority. We look at authorities like, you know, husbands, you're head of your household, and you would dominate your wife, or whatever. But look what Jesus, he changed the word of uh, the purpose of authority around a little bit. Let's look at Matthew, if you will with me. I should have wrote all these scriptures out, but let's turn to Matthew. This way you can look in your Bibles and really see that it's not Bob uh, speaking, but it's for the word of God. Matthew chapter 20, verse 25, or 20 through 25. This was this was this is a great story. This is uh, this is uh, uh, James and John's mother comes to Jesus and wants Jesus, wants her sons to be sitting at his right or left hand. And so Jesus says, "It's not a, it's not for me to say what if, if we'll get to heaven, who's going to sit at my right, who's going to sit at my left." And then he says, he says this, all authority says, verse twenty five. Uh, Jesus called uh, them together and said, "Call the disciples together," because they were kind of like, "Hey, what is this?" Why is John and James going to be on my right or left side? What's all this about? Jesus is going to explain something to the whole group. And he called them together. He says, you know that the rules of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. That's not the authority. That the way the Gentiles have authority is not, what, is not what you are about. It's not what we should be about. It says, instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be the servants, and whoever wants to be first must be last. Just as the Son of Man did not come to, to, be, to be served, but to serve, and to give him life as a ransom for many. So Jesus reset up the authority, he changed it. Not that I'm in charge of everything, even though he was and is. He says he came to serve. And he came, changed the whole idea of authority around. I came to serve, I came to die for many. Also, look what Jesus did in John 13. This is a story about Jesus, his last message to the disciples before he went to be executed. Before he was arrested. He did this. He took a bowl of water and a towel and he wrapped it around himself. And he knelt down and he began to wash all the disciples' feet. You remember the story? He did that because he said to them, you think about it, he, Jesus knew that they were going to have great power. Jesus knew that the Holy Spirit was going to come and fill his disciples, and they were going to lay hands on the sick, and they were going to be healed, the blind were going to see, the deaf were going to hear. <coughs> Amen? He knew they were going to have this great power, but he, he didn't want them to focus on the power. He wanted them to say, listen, you're here to serve all of mankind. You're going to have a message of hope for the world. You're going to give eternal, you're going to have a message of eternal life. And I want you to do this. I want you to wash. I want to wash your feet because I want to give you an example of how you're going to serve the world. Amen? That's the authority that you have. Serve one another. Amen? So our attitude should be that of Christ. Who, really being equal with God, did not feel like that was something he needed to hold on to. 
but he took on the form of man to become a servant and to serve. So both headship and submission are the Jesus role. We each get the opportunity to play that role in our relationship and then even play it out in front of the world so that they can really see what that's all about. So in Philippians 2, if submission is the thing that I should do, in Ephesians chapter 5, when it says, wives, submit to your husband. If that's the thing that I should do in light of the fact that Jesus, the second person of the Godhead, submitted himself to the Father, and it didn't hurt him any, then it's not going to hurt me any to be submissive to my husband. Because in our relationship, I know that he would lay his life down for me. He thinks of me all the time. What do you want to do? Where do you want to go eat? How would you like this? He's thinking of me. It's never about this is what I want. I want this and I want that. It's not that way. I know that he loves me. Because he submits and he thinks of me. He's willing to lay his life down. And, and when he does that, it's not so hard to submit to him. Because really, that's the way that God created it. Now I want to take this a step further and go back to that idea that we are called. We are all called the sons of God. We're all called the sons of God, equal, together. And Paul reminds us that there is no difference, Jew or Greek, bond or free, woman, male or female. There's no, there's no distinction in the body of Christ that we're all the same. And so it's not like he's better than me. Because that's not what it is. He's not better than me. We're equal together. And if you go, you know, this is really, really kind of cool. If you go to Genesis chapter 1, okay, in the beginning, when God's talking about that, the Hebrew word, if you go to Genesis chapter, actually, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 2, verse 18 through 20, it talks about that God wanted to make a helper for the man. Everything was good. He looked at the, the, the everything he had created. Oh, it is good, it is good, it is good. And then what did he say? He looked at man and he said, oh, this is not good. This is not good for him to be alone. To be alone. Right? Yeah, and so, so what did he do? He created a helper. <coughs> now that doesn't mean I help him by doing his dishes, doing his laundry, by taking out the trash, by cleaning the ice. It's not that I'm your helper in that manner. I mean, I do help you make sure that you stay dressed properly. But, um, you know, I mean, the, the helper here is not that kind of helper. Okay? <coughs> the Hebrew word for helper here is azer. Azer. And this word is used really in the Old Testament. It's not used so much in the New Testament. But this word, azer, means in context, vitally important. It is not good that man should be alone. Or woman. Or woman. Yeah, okay. well, we want to include that, okay? We were created for a purpose, right? Azer, a helper. And if you look at it, there's, it comes from two root words, which means to rescue. To save. And it also means strength. To rescue, to save, and it means strength. So the way that God created him and the way that God created me is that when we're together, we fit completely. 
I complete him and he completes me. To rescue, to save, strength. So if we are all sons of God, we're equal. He doesn't lord it over me like the Gentiles did in their leadership. But we're co-heirs with Christ. You know, and, and if you even look at it, in, it when Paul talks about um, the bride of Christ, like Pastor said, amen, you're a bride. So it's not a gender role. It's not something that's only for women or for men. I mean, it's, it's, there's no gender roles here. We are all equal, sons and daughters, <coughs> in the eyes of God. Willing to submit to one another, they're willing to love one another, willing to serve one another, willing to do whatever it takes to bring glory to our Father. Mm -hmm. That's what it's about, bringing glory to Him. So in our life, we want to serve God when, at age 19, when I became a Christian, and age 22 or 23, when I got called us into ministry, at that time, all we wanted to do was serve God. Sometimes we did a good job at it, and sometimes we didn't do such a good job at it. But all our life, that's all we care about. All we want is God to be glorified. To the day we take our last breath, we will serve the Lord. I will serve Tina. She will serve me. I will honor her. She will honor me. And life is good. Right? When, um, when we were going back to studying this out this past week, I had a, a revelation that I'm missing because I thought I would just preach this sermon on this is what the husband's supposed to do and this is what the wife's supposed to do and that's just the way it is. And uh, through much arguing and research and studying and prayer, I said, man, maybe I've missed this. Maybe, I, maybe I've been teaching something that's more cultural than it is actual gospel. The truth is, we are to serve one another with all the heart, soul, mind, body, strength. First Peter 4, 11 says this, if anyone speaks, they should do so as we, now listen to this, First Peter 4, 11, if anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. How many read that scripture before? Huh? When you say things, this is heavy. So when I say things to Tina, if we're in a discussion, I should say, as I'm saying, how would God treat her? Or how should we treat each other? If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength of God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. So I'm thinking, my whole life, I've, I've been thinking about, look, hey, did I preach good that day? I want to hear from you. Did I, did Pastor Bob do a good job? I want to hear some praises, you know? I want to I say, did I do something well? Did, you know, do I get all my praises from, or am I saying, did the people in the church this Sunday, or the time I get to meet with them at my mission community, did, are they getting closer to Jesus? Are they, are, am I giving all the glory for what happens, good in my life, to the Lord? Do you ever hear people testify like, God uh, did this for me, or, or, or you know, I got to thank God for my promotion, or whatever? It, that's, and when you do that, you're giving God glory. Hey, I, didn't, I, I went to the interview, I did what I had to do, but it's God that pointed me to this position. I give Him praise for that, and I thank Him. And I remember in our early Christian walk, and even now today, and I don't really have job interviews or anything, but I think when I was in the military, I was in the military... I was the, um, for whatever reason, I was able to be in a position where I was always a senior lowest rank person. So if I was a private, I was a senior private. And that was by date of rank. So I entered the Marine Corps in this day, and these guys under, with me as privates, they all entered the day after me. So I became the senior private. I became the senior Lance Corporal, the senior Corporal. As I became a believer, I became the senior uh, uh, sergeant, and then the senior staff sergeant, the senior gunning. And I was, a ma I was a senior master sergeant in all of the Marine Corps for a couple of years. Amazing. God promoted me. 
We gave him glory all the time. Every time there was a decision I had to make, I made I praised God for it. Every time I had to do a job, God, thank you for helping me through this situation. And God continued to bless and continues to bless. Because I want you to have the same thing. Our whole lives, if you read this gospel from Genesis to Revelation, it tells us about the redemption that God gave us through his son Jesus. That's what this, all these stories are about. All the history behind the, the Jewish people in the Old Testament, how they rebelled, how they wanted to do their own thing, and, and how they messed up, and God had to redeem them and rescue them, is our life every day. It's hard not to be selfish. And that's the number one problem I see in marriages today. We're selfish. We want to do our own thing. We want to do it our way. She has to fulfill my needs. And fill my needs. What, if we, what if we turn that around and say, I'm here to serve you. I'm here to love you. I'm here to die for you. I'm here, I'm here to do that. Not only in our marriages, our relationship, but in everything that we do. In your workplace. Oh, can we just live Christians? Live to love Jesus and know Him and hear His heartbeat and be able to serve Him with everything within us. We can change the world. Well, let's just change Madison. Let's change our workplace. Let's change our homes. Because all I want is serve Jesus. I was thinking that um, when we bought the, the, the duplex, uh, you know, it's, it's just... It's just a little duplex, not really big. I mean, but I thought my wife deserves like a big house, you know. We have a big family, so we need a big yard to play in. We need, you know, a fireplace, so we need a huge. Tina loves, how many of Tina loves to cook, mm -hmm. right? And so, I mean, she deserves one of those kitchens you see on TV or in the magazines, you know, the big uh, uh, preparation counter, what do they call that? And eight, o eight ovens and, you know, big gas stove and, you know, all those fancy pots and pans, but you know, she doesn't care about that. I'll, she'll, she'll cook in the backyard if that's all I had to cook on. It doesn't matter. All we want is that people that we meet love Jesus. Marriages will change. Think about it. If you have argument and you have to be like, it says, you know, as you speak, you speak as unto God, you, you would get all arguments would end, right? Oh, I just want to remind you, honey, before you say another word, you just say things like, gee, you know what I'm saying? I mean, just, wouldn't that change a little bit? Like, oh, um, yeah, okay, thank you for that reminder. Uh, um, yeah, I love you, baby. That's it, you know? What else, what else are you going to do? I remember we went years and years. I think, I can't even remember sometimes. I remember our, one of our first arguments. I was so mad at you. See, we were, after we became a believer, I remember our very one of our very first arguments. Well, I remember we had an argument. That, okay, I remember we had an argument. I to this day can't remember what we argued about. Can you? No. I remember because this is what I remember. I remember grabbing her because this is what the Holy Spirit said to me. Stop. That's what He said to me. Stop. I'm like, okay, we need to stop. She was mad. I said, no, we're not arguing no more. Well, I, uh, she got, she was, now she get mad because she couldn't argue. You were hearing I, me. I wasn't listening. I said, no, 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 you got to listen. Holy Spirit said not to do this. Stop. And uh, I gently picked her up. I was much bigger than then. And I set her on her bed, at the end of her bed. We sat down there. And then instantly, we began to laugh. <coughs> Like, we just laughed, and we laughed, and we laughed, and I'm like, what were we arguing about? We don't know. So we argued about what we didn't, we were, didn't argue about. No, just kidding. We were just, we was like, what was that about? And he say, and why I remember that so distinctly, because in the middle of our, uh, our husbandly house. wife discussion, uh, the Holy Spirit says, stop. And at that moment, I had a choice. <coughs> to be obedient to what the Holy Spirit was saying, or just continue to do what I wanted. Because maybe I was right. I don't know if I was right or not, but maybe I was right. Or maybe she was right and I wouldn't admit it. Whatever. Probably she was right and I didn't admit it. You know, it, it, I've had those discussions. Um, but I wanted, I wanted our marriage to be like what God wants to. So as a new believer, 19 years old, I was married. We got married at 18. Became a Christian at 19. 
And every time I found a Bible, and I was just learning about the Bible, so I learned about John 3.16. I learned, uh, I remember I read that people at our house, and that's all I taught them. I didn't know nothing else. Nicodemus went to Jesus. Jesus, they went about it, had a message of eternal life. And Nicodemus says this, okay, yes, he believed in Jesus. So I, I, that's all I taught. And, um, but I would research marriage. So I, I read this passage in Ephesians. All right, baby. The Bible says, you're my wife, and you're supposed to submit to me. I said, I said those words. I couldn't believe I said those words. And, 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 and she would say, okay, well, that's what the Bible says. But one thing that Tina had, that maybe some people have, her mother was very submissive to her father out of different reasons, but she was. Well, one of the things that I remember Mom doing, and, and we were already in high school, and, and so he, he did something. My father did something that made her mad. And she started griping and complaining and talking about my father. And it's the only time I ever remember her doing that. But then she says she remembers watching my sister and I. And guess what we did? We griped and complained about our dad and what our dad was doing, and how he was doing this, and how he was doing that. And it was a real lesson that the Lord used in her life about not talking about your husbands. But my mother then, you know, it was she was always submissive to dad. She, whatever he said, whatever they did, it was always whatever dad said. And as he said, for other reasons, but that was, that was what she did. And so when it came to our relationship, even when we were dating, it wasn't difficult for me to submit to him because that was the example that I had seen in my mother. You know, that she was submissive to her husband, that she loved him, that she did those things. So when we were even dating, his stuff belonged to me and my stuff belonged to me. No, it was not. <laughs> you know, but we was it was everything that we did, you know, it was it was together. It was for us. And when we were talking about getting married, divorce was not part of our vocabulary. It was never the idea that if you ever cease to satisfy me or my needs or provide a life the way that I am used to having provided to me, then at that moment, that will be the loophole that I use to get out of our contract. That was never part of the option. That would have been the first week we, she moved down to North Carolina yes. and I put her in a little shack, two bedroom with furnished for $125. It was not the little mansion that she lived in before that. No, it wasn't. And I, and, and I really had that moment. She had moment, an option right there. I, and at that moment when, see, he came to pick me up in Charlotte. We lived in Jacksonville, North Carolina on the coast. He drove all the way to Charlotte to pick me up. Okay, 10 hours. And then I get this phone call. Tina Castrello, please come to blah, blah, blah. There's a phone call. He's late. <laughs> you know, he's not even there to pick me up. So we drive in, and it's nighttime. I don't even see the surroundings, right? Thank you, Jesus. We drove in, got in the house. There we are. We're in our apartment. And I wake up the next morning, and I look out the window. Of course, the house, again, was it was a two-bedroom furnished you know, two bedrooms, a bathroom, the living room, and the kitchen, and that was it. The kitchen could reach like every block, and it's just from the city. And so I get up, okay, 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 okay. And then I walked out the front door, and I had to, I asked, okay, this, I can, I can do this. There was sand, the, the out in front of the house, really not much grass at all, and the driveway was sand. And there were lots of pine trees, and I could see the water because we were off the inlet, we were ever inlet. And I said, okay. Beach house. Beach house. It's like when I went to the lake with my family, you know? I mean, that's how I just, it was okay, okay, I, I can do this. I, I can do this, you know? So it wasn't about what he could provide for me, how he could supply all my needs. It was really, this is our relationship, and I, forever be your wife, no matter what, no matter what, even if we have to eat pork and beans out of camera, <laughs> it will be got, okay. We got stories, but yeah. um, what we learned after um, maybe 38 years of your marriage, yeah. and what we've learned with our relationship with God, is that God provides what I need. God provides what she needs. And then we serve each other and we honor each other and we walk together trying to emulate the very image of God in our lives every day and in our marriage and in our finances and all that we do for His glory. And so we just want to encourage you this morning.
like Jesus. Don't be like Bob and Tina. Don't be like, just be like Jesus. And the reason, I think, can I just, I want to take communion here. Andy, would you help me with, or Angel, would you help me with the communion? And Andy. Can I, and you might be going there, but I, I, I really have to, sh to share the motivation for our lives. Okay, and, you know, when, when he mentioned that when, when we started serving Christ, it was really for his glory. Everything that we did was for him. We were involved in ministry. Everything that we did was to lead, bring people to Christ, to teach them about Christ. We got involved in children's ministry before we had children. We taught rainbow class. And then we, you know, we, we grew them up. We did that. And then we, have, then we were given the gift of children. But that didn't change what our ministry focus was. We still did everything for Christ. Our goal was not to gather things or possessions. Our goal was to serve him. We have pictures of the family doing street ministry. We have pictures. I was, I remember being, expecting, oh, in Okinawa, we did Okinawa, and uh, we did um, ministry there. The first day that we're on the island, and we came, we went, decided to go to the church, you know, at the neighborhood assembly. <coughs> we walked into the doors, and we had three kids, okay? Children should be taken care of, right? We got there, and the person who did children's church left on emergency leave. So we're walking to drop our children off in children's church, and guess what? There's no children's pastor. So what did we do? Okay, baby, let's put together a lesson, and here we go. Well, we're going to do children's church. We're going to teach the lesson. That was what we did. Everything we did, even the children came along, and they were part of the ministry that we did. When we were in California, in Oceanside, California, we did street ministry. The children came along with us. I was pregnant with Christopher for the whole, I mean, with children's ministry. There's pictures of me doing children's, us doing children's ministry. Andrew and, and Charity and Amy were all involved. We're all out there having a good time, you know, leading the kids and, and, and I'm pregnant. And then I had, I, I, we were supposed to have a Christmas party, but I was in the hospital with Christopher, so they got to go do that. And then they came. But then the very next thing is you see pictures, and I've got Christopher in one of those little snuggly things on front of me. And we're doing children's ministry on the street, in the church, everything. Every single one of the kids were a part of children's ministry because we wanted to live our lives out before them, serving God. The mission that, that Jesus gave each one of us was to lead people to Christ. All of us go into all the world and preach the gospel, the good news. And that's what we did. And even, even yesterday, and I'm going to share this with you, I'll put it back to you. That's all right. Okay. Even yesterday, so we're thinking about our time to think of examples of things that we did. And honest, honestly, when I say this, you can ask the kids. That's what we did. We didn't go on vacations. We didn't go fishing, and I love fishing. We used to do fishing all the time. We didn't go fishing. We didn't go on vacations. Very rarely did we go to amusement parks. I think there's just a couple times that we can talk about going to an amusement park and having a good time with that. Our total focus was serving Christ. And so we've had conversations because, you know, you go to these marriage seminars and you go to these different things and it says have a hobby, have something that you... And we talk, you know, like, so what's our hobby? Um, Jesus. 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 Hallelujah. That's what we did. Praise God. No questions. It was Jesus. And because it 
was Jesus. This works. And only because of Jesus. Because even though he'll tell you I'm not selfish, I think I might be sometimes, maybe. A little bit somewhere. Only because of Jesus in me does this work. Only because I am seeking him does this work. Our first priority in life must be this. Because if we get this right, Jesus told us, you seek the first, if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, his, the right relationship with him, then everything else is going to be added. Everything else is going to be taken care of. So I humbly submit myself to him. And he gives me what I need so that I can humbly submit to him. <coughs> so if we could sum up today, we can say that <coughs> we need Jesus. I need him as my savior. service today, I wanted to remind you of what Jesus did for us. As often as you do this, you remember his death, you remember his resurrection, you remember that Jesus coming back. Not that he only, not that Jesus did all those wonderful things for us. Praise God that he did. I'm so happy that he forgave me of my sin and cleansed me from the things that I was. I'm a new person now in Christ Jesus. We remember his power of what he did for us. He laid his life down willingly for us. He was obedient to the Father for us. He suffered and died so that we could be redeemed for our sins, for us, that we may be whole. So if you have the wafer, you take that put out of your hand. And the Bible tells it teaches us that his body was broken for you and me. Isaiah records in 53 that through his broken body, through the whipping, through the beating that he took on us, we can have our healing. And as we project it today, I want you to ask the Lord if you have a physical need in your body and you need to be healed, we're going to ask God to do that because Jesus provided that for us. Amen? Amen. And I'm going to have Andy, would you just pray since you have a broken hand right now? I want you to pray for your healing and for the healing of everybody here and thank Jesus for his broken body. Yeah. Jesus, we come before you because Jesus, you are strengthening <coughs> our hearts and our lives. Jesus, you four stripes in your back, your body was broken on our behalf. Take your representation of your body this morning. 
is the cost hope in the work that you did on the cross, that there is hope for healing, that, that our faith is met with power. Amen. And so today we, we put our faith, we put our hope, we put our dependence on you. Yes. And we receive the healing. We thank you, Jesus, that we no longer have to remain broken, that there is a promise of, of wholeness in, even in our physical body. So today we remember you, Jesus. We, we thank you and we receive the healing for our broken bodies. our relationship with you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, obedience. For loving us. Jesus. And you all particularly come together. Jesus. 
Yeah. I can represent you, Father. Lord, I, I can re represent you in the world, Lord God. I can. I want to bring you glory through my life. I want to bring you glory, God, in my marriage. I want to bring glory in the relations that I have with my coworkers. I want to bring glory to the relationship that I have with students, Lord God. I want to bring. bring I want to bring glory, Father, to you and all that I do, and all that I say, Father God. As I serve God, I want to bring glory to you, Lord God. Yes, let Lord nothing God. be of myself, Lord God, but let it be for you, Lord God, and for your glory. Father, I thank you for that, Lord. I'm cleansed by Jesus' blood. I may hold because of Him, Lord God. I'm so, so grateful, Lord God, you have given us a a responsibility to represent you, you in this God. world. So, Father, everybody that's here today, Lord, we just want to say together, we're, you're, we're your body. We're here to serve you, Lord God. We're here to represent you in the world, Lord God. Yes. Father, I thank you Father, for that. Lord God. I thank you, Father. I thank you. And, Father, today as we close, Lord, I just pray a blessing over each person. Father, whatever's in our lives that hinder us from being like you, God, I ask that you remove it right now in the name of Jesus. Release, Father, the, God, the, the selfishness, Lord God, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And I thank you for that, Father God. Father, I thank you for the hearts that are seeking after you, Lord God. I pray, God, that they find you. They get a hold of you. They be like you, Lord God. And for, for some that are we're struggling with our identity right now, God, I pray that you reveal through your spirit truth. Yes, Father. I thank you for that, Father God. My Bless God. your children. Bless your sons and your daughters this morning. Bless your bride. God, as a bride, anticipating the bridegroom coming, God, I pray we get ready. To, to, uh, we get ready, God. Hallelujah. We get ready. You fill our cups, Lord. Fill us up with your spirit that we may walk in the way you want us to, Lord God. And I thank you, God. And when I stop and fall, God, you pick me. Yes, Father God. Hallelujah. When I change my mind into doing things for myself and not for you, God, help me to stay straight on the path, Lord God. And I thank you for that. I thank you, Lord. Yes. Bless this group of believers, Father. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Come on, Chris. Give him thanks. Right. Give him a clap, Father. Thank you, Jesus.